The world has come a long way since 1948 when the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was drawn up. And I remember a few years ago reading a, a comment by Jeffrey uh, where he said the the, S, the 17 SDGs that were put up in uh, in 2015 are really the embodiment of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It's an effort. We've come a long way since we wrote some idealistic principles where no rights for enforcement and, and no real clear plans or goals or targets of how we, we would achieve them. And I think it's really important that we recognize uh, the consensus and commitment of the leadership of 193 countries and multilateral institutions to do this is absolutely unprecedented in, in world affairs. Mobilizing the world's knowledge, technological capacities, financial resources, and organizational cap capabilities as well. And yet, there's a sense, a, a, a growing sense that somehow we're falling behind. Somehow uh, we haven't, we're not doing enough with all the tremendous efforts that the SDSN network and so many institutions and so many national governments are doing. And I think it's important to look at human security in that light and see how it fits in to, to this situation. Our educational system, we had an, a conference on education a few months ago, calling on all the disciplines of higher education and asking them, what are you doing to, con what are you as a discipline, not as an in doing, to contribute to the realization of the SDGs or, or human security for all? And I think in spite of outstanding examples and exceptions, the fact is, by and large, on a global level, our educational system hasn't changed that much to catch up with the urgency and the goals that are before us. We have many citizens in the world, too many citizens in the world, including educated ones who've never heard of the SDGs, or if they've heard of them, they wonder, what does that have to do with us or me? Uh, that's not my, uh, my role. Uh, of course, since then, very unexpected events have taken place with COVID-19 and then the war in Ukraine, and now the climate crisis, which is growing and uh, in intensity and momentum uh, almost by the month, uh, and that diverts our attention away and our resources away from the really tremendous challenges that humanity already faced before these things happened. What does this have to do with human security. I think it's interesting to note that at a time with unprecedented economic development in the world, unprecedented technological advances in the world, there seems to be a growing sense of uncertainty and even a growing sense of insecurity at a time when by many parameters, in spite of the, the local dislocations, uh, overall parameters are more positive than they've ever been before. And we've made a lot of progress on the SDGs, on many of them, even if it's not as much as was expected. And I think that's important because it highlights one of the dimensions of human security. Human security doesn't just depend on the objective quantitative measures uh, at the macro level. It's very much a subjective sense uh, of how people feel individually and how they feel has as much to do with what they imagine is going to come in the future as they do to what has happened in the past, perhaps even more so. So the question for us is a question that the Academy is asking in this, in the, uh, in the human security campaign is what more can we do to build on the tremendous efforts, unprecedented efforts that are being taken and how can human security be viewed as a complement to all the work that's already being done? It, it covers the same territory uh, as the SDGs, but from slightly a, a different uh, point of view. Uh, what can we do to get the message through more effectively that Agenda 2030 whether we call it by one name or another, is of absolutely vital personal significance and importance to the security and future of everybody on, work, on earth. What's missing and how can, we, uh, uh, how can we multiply this unprecedented achievement 
and accelerate progress on it. And that's where I think human security comes in. A tremendous amount of effort is being by, done by the multilateral organizations and by national governments uh, and, uh, to, to, and, and, and civil society to a considerable extent as well, and research institutes and academic institutions as well, uh, to try to bring these goals into focus and impose and implement a global campaign. But the process of development is not really a program of government. The process of development is a, an action of the whole society. Uh, and we have lessons from the past, from the past three quarters of a century, that show that top-down centralized planning, government policies, and organizational machinery, as important as they are, are not sufficient to really achieve the on-the-ground results that we need, especially when they're as vast uh, as we have today. And we have the example of what it means when the society as a whole can be actively mobilized uh, to work for global social goals. We saw during the time of the East Asian tigers of how they developed so rapidly because they succeeded in engaging the whole society in that effort. China in recent decades has done remarkably in turning from just a top down, but to also trying to release the energies at, the, at a bottom up also. Visionary leaders are needed to launch a revolution, but revolutions are not just are won by the people, not just by the leaders. And the question is, what can we do to mobilize greater support, greater in initiative, greater involvement of global society to do something that's entirely meant for them? I'm speaking from India, where I have spent most or a good part of the last 50 years, and in the course of it studied a lot of what has happened in this part of the world. 1965-66, uh, FAO uh, predicted that there would be 10 million deaths from famine in India due to two successive years of drought. And they would have been right if it hadn't been for the visionary, a visionary leaders and a visionary government that launched what became known as the Green Revolution. Uh, what they, but the thing they did in doing it, and it's often been let, lost sight of, it was not the government that doubled the food grain production of India in 50 years and made the country food self-sufficient in five years. It was their success in mobilizing and engaging tens of millions of farmers to act differently than they had for hundreds of years as traditional and largely uneducated farmers. They succeeded in taking a top-down program and marrying it with a bottom-up program that engaged the society fully in it. And I think that's the way I look at human security as a call. Human security is talking about the same issues as Agenda 2030, as the 17 SDGs, or at least most of them, but it's doing it from a personal point of view. It's trying to make this message relevant to everybody on earth and asking, what does it mean to you? What can you do? What does this whole effort mean to you? It's a personalized call as uh, it's an individualized call. Uh, and the message is uh, that uh, together, together, the global establishments and the global society together, we can do this and we can dramatically improve uh, the progress we've had so far. So much more could be done when we all focus, including our corporations, including our interfaith groups, including uh, our educational institutions, all disciplines of education, whether it's the arts or sciences uh, or professions uh, or uh, humanities, whatever it is, there's something we can all do to support this effort, which is really for everybody. As human security as an idea was launched in 1994, by UNDP, by Mabobal Haq, who uh, after the end of the Cold War, when there was really a commitment to what can we do now that war is behind us? 
we were a little too optimistic about that, unfortunately. Uh, but we had some time in which to, to do something. And they came up with the idea, let's try to focus on how do we mobilize people, individuals, to get involved with this, communities, local communities, local institutions, local businesses, and so forth. And the campaign that we're doing is intended for engaging with uh, with uh, the inter-academy panel of 140 plus uh, science academies. We're also working with the inter-parliamentary union of 170, 179 national parliaments to work with the parliamentarians about what they can do and with filmmakers and artists and educators and others as well, because we think that the combination of the Agenda 2030 17 Development Goals and the effort to mobilize and, and win, release the energy and aspiration of, of people, large numbers of people. There's uh, the interfaith groups themselves represent hundreds of millions of people uh, who could be who who have a stake in this as just an example. So I think the question before us is really an important one, and that's my reason for starting off here rather than talking about the measurements. Human security adds some complexity to that because it's human centered, because it's person centered, because it's contextual, uh, because it's trying to look from the perspective of individuals. There's a it may be more difficult and more challenging to find the right metrics uh, that can really reflect the change in perceptions. The objective challenges of development are not the sole, in some places they're not even the main challenge. The real challenge is getting our society together. The kind of polarization we see in many countries, and especially my own, uh, uh, about uh, the... Uh, between groups that are fighting between themselves, the sense of that we're working together, the sense comes only when there's a sense of trust and security. And we our institutions seem to be losing that trust and security at a time when it's absolutely vital uh, and essential uh, to do that. 